Members, we now move to questions for the Minister of Finance, and I call Mr. Jerry Carroll. Mr. Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, does the Minister have any plans to lower corporation tax to below the 12.5% rate in the Republic of Ireland? Mr. Um, uh, in, in response, uh, I can call you to question number one, no. Mr. McCarroll, for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his quick response and I would ask as a supplementary that given the fact that the effective corporation tax rate in the South is in reality uh, 3% due to loop loopholes, um, if the Minister's intention is to harmonise corporation tax across Ireland, is he not entering into a race to the bottom that will lead this Assembly to an effective rate of 3% as well in order to achieve this harmonisation? I thank the member for his uh, supplementary. Uh, the answer to that is no as well. Uh, if we equalise corporation tax on the island to 12.5 per cent, that is my intent and my resolve. Uh, you can be quite sure of this. Uh, when we do reduce the level of corporation tax in order to create thousands of new jobs, uh, 32,000 we predict by 2033, uh, we will be ensuring that everyone pays uh, their full commitment in terms of tax taxation. On top of that, I will be emphasising to the business sector that they, they have stewardship of business uh, in this part of the world. If tax is reduced, we want to see that go going. We want to see increased profits going back into investment, into R and D, uh, into building better businesses. But let me say this <clears throat> to the member: I stood on the border at Newry last Saturday with Protestants and Catholics, unionists and nationalists, small business representatives, representatives of the, far the farming uh, sector, uh, representatives of the third sector, people gathering uh, because they're worried, very worried about the implications and ramifications of, of a Brexit. And I looked round and I looked for Mr. Carroll to see if he was standing with the workers, if he was standing with the small business people, if he was standing with the social enterprises who have done so much to build up our communities, and he wasn't there. So when it comes to standing with those who are working to create a better society, especially in the border region, who have, who have suffered long and hard over many years and are now enjoying the benefits of an open border, I can assure them that we will stand for job creation. We will stand with those who are going to benefit uh, by uh, obtaining employment in the time ahead. And we will stand resolutely, resolutely for a shared and prosperous society in the future. Call well, Mr. Philip Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister, with Brexit likely to be implemented in 2019, has the Minister received any advice regarding whether the Azor ruling now even remains applicable? And can he give us a commitment that he will push to ensure that the £275 million cost of the Northern Ireland Bloc grant in 2020, for instance, can be avoided? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I thank uh, Mr. Smith. I think that's two questions. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to both of them. First of all, um, he's right that the, uh, the, the Treasury, before they abandoned ship after the EU referendum and stopped talking to us, that they were saying that the cost to the block grant would be £270 million. Pounds. I, I can assure uh, Mr Smith, and I'll be asking every member of this Assembly to support me in this, that when negotiations uh, are kick-started and restart again, and hopefully I'm meeting the Chief Secretary to the Treasury next Monday. That will give us a chance to say we need to have this uh, concentrated uh, engagement again. Uh, I will be saying that uh, that is, is, is unacceptable, that it is too high, uh, that it, it factors in uh, issues which we don't believe are relevant. And we will fight for a, an affordable deal, but also a fair and proportionate deal. Um, I, 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 can, I can assure him that in the time ahead, while this is a matter for the executive uh, fighting to ensure that we get the best deal possible, that there is a role uh, for every member of this assembly. Uh, though, because, of course, in the Fresh Start Agreement, this was supported by all the parties and all the signatories to, to that agreement. Uh, so what I would say is that uh, we should all, when I meet the Chief Secretary to the Treasury next Monday, I'll be saying, let's have this engagement, because we do need a, a runway into a reduction in corporation tax. We want to get the maximum benefits in terms of job creation. But I do hope those parties who signed up to Fresh Start remain resolute and supportive of my efforts at that time. Ms. Clare. 
Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, the previous member and the Minister have acknowledged the impact uh, that a Brexit would have on our corporation tax strategy. It would leave it in tatters. Uh, will the Minister consider incorporating a sunset clause in any uh, corporation tax proposals so that if the prevailing context doesn't mean that we get these uh, promised new jobs, then at least we won't have to continue taking a hit from the public purse? Well, uh, in, in, term, in terms of, of the EU referendum, the discussion around a Brexit, I don't know if the member read the papers at the weekend, but there's certainly uh, increasing uncertainty coming out of London rather than, rather than clarity in, in relation to even the intentions of the, of the British Chancellor. So uh, let's not um, run away from the challenge in the time ahead, and let's not uh, count, count our chickens before they're hatched. Uh, regarding to Azores, our sunset clauses, I actually think if we're speaking to the international business community and asking them to make a, a, a vote of confidence and investment in us by locating new business here, I think the last thing we need to do is start having a series of caveats in relation to the corporation tax uh, strategy. Uh, I think we need to, we need to stay firm. If, if there's a change, for example, and Mr. Hammond has been unclear in relation to the level of corporation tax going forward, so that may change. Uh, if there's a change in relation to our status within the EU, I think we, we will re respond to all those things positively, constructively, hopefully as a, as, a, as, a, as a corporate body in terms of an assembly. But we shouldn't, and I'll be in San Francisco at the end of the, the month speaking to potential investors, we shouldn't say to them that our, our message is now uh, getting mixed. It should be a very clear message. I am confident and committed. Fresh Start Agreement commits, commits us uh, as an executive to introducing corporation tax at 12.5 per cent in April 2018 uh, I, and in, a, in, a, in a way which is affordable to our budgets. And I'm confident that I'm committed to that goal. Members, I must inform the House that question 3, 8 and 13 have been withdrawn. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Mr Speaker. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Dunn. Uh, with your permission, uh, I will answer questions two and seven together. Uh, I plan to take this work forward in ways that will stimulate economic activity, tackle dereliction, and help our struggling high streets. Uh, these are my priorities in reforming uh, the non domestic rate system. Uh, the rating system is a, a, a distribution mechanism, and it doesn't share the rates out as fairly as it could. Uh, I want to make changes so that those who clearly can pay do so, uh, and those that need help and assistance uh, can get it. I also want to look at ways of widening the tax base, and the member will be very aware why, why we need to bring in additional fun funds. Uh, but I also want to widen the tax base to help ease the pain on those paying more than they can sustain. And the member will know his experience in Bangor that sometimes businesses go out of, out of business and many businesses blame that on the rates burden, so trying to get that balance right. Uh, a major area of concern is the continued relevance and affordability of all the reliefs and exemptions we provide through the system. I refer to this as, 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 as spray and pray. I don't think it's directed enough. Uh, and I am uh, suggesting, uh, and we'll be bringing forward proposals on how we can be more precise with our rate reliefs or rate, rates assistance. I have listened to the business community and councils on this subject. I plan to deliver a step change in responding to this important review. I intend making a statement to the Assembly the week beginning 14th of November, setting out a series of options for reforming the system. These changes will need legislation. Therefore, the Member and the Assembly will have a full opportunity to consider and to shape the reforms, and I hope I can count the Member's support when we get to that point. Well, Mr Dunn, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I do thank the Minister for uh, his answer today and his positive points he has already made, and I, I do appreciate that he does know Bangor and the North Town constituency quite well, as I understand he ran there as a candidate some time ago. But will the Minister give us an assurance that he will do something, and he has already mentioned, I suppose, something to address the high level of retail vacancies in town centres in North Town, especially in Bangor, where we are trying to regenerate and rebuild the town? Well, I, I, I'm I'm, the member won't remember this, but there was a picky pool in Bangor, and I'm old enough to have, to have been swimming there in my youth as well, long before, long before I stood with some uh, fame in an election there in, in 1997, I believe. Um, uh, I think the commitment is this, that we all know we need to uh, really give a, a boost to, 
town centres. And you know, when I travel Bangor, I know it's a little bit better uh, than the last time I was there. Newry, uh, Dromore, um, sometimes parts of Belfast. Uh, we need a thriving high street, thriving retail sector. Uh, so we have to do. We have to take actions to support that. I have to tell the member that I am supportive of the proposition made uh, by our friends in the tourism, hospitality, and independent retail sector. I, I uh, gave Christ a meeting of the Finance Committee, la committee last week when their representatives were presenting to the committee, and I am sympathetic to that. And perhaps as we move forward, instead of having very broad reliefs, perhaps we could look at targeting support towards those businesses which are independent retail, tourism, and hospitality. Call Mr. Joanne Dobson. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister acknowledge that the true extent of the damage caused by last year's flawed re-rating process may never be known? And given the extent of the errors made as evidenced through the, the number of appeals uh, pro, through the process, what guarantees will the Minister give small businesses that a situation like this will be avoided in the future? Well, I thank the member for her question. I meet uh, business people all the time who benefited. Uh, from the redistribution of the rates burden because, of course, there were losers, but there were also winners. And among those who you might refer to as, as losers in this were the large supermarkets, some of the very profitable petrol station come supermarkets. Uh, and I actually agree with that redistribution. I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, but there, there is more, uh, I think, partnership rather than even help and assistance. There's, a, there's an enhanced partnership needed between us and small business, I would say, in the time ahead uh, to try and uh, produce this, this uh, strong, vibrant high streets and town centres we want to see. Um, I meet many people who appeal at their rates, and I certainly encourage anyone who feels they should appeal to appeal, uh, but I think I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't accept, neither would my colleagues in the LPS, that every time someone appeals, that means there has been an error. Call Mrs. Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers um, so far, and thank him too for sending us down uh, memory lane with the picky pool I remember swimming in the shallow end some time ago. Um, just to follow on from your questions, um, to ask the Minister if um, is there an intention to retain the small business relief, rate relief programme? Well, I thank the member for our question. I think we should. We, I think we should reform it. I think it's too general. Um, I, I do. Uh, I'm a supporter of the back in business relief, whereas if a building has been empty or a, or a premises which has been empty for a year, we, we give rate relief to those who occupy it. I do think we should look at what the, our friends in the University of Ulster at Oxford Economics refer to as geographical reliefs, that perhaps instead of saying everyone uh, is eligible to a small business rate relief, that actually we look at how we could zero in, focus in on geographical areas. That will take more research and may require uh, some type of of uh, test case to do that. Um, but the bottom line is this. Uh, the rates can be a tough burden. Uh, we need to make sure that we're not hindering business through the rates. We need them to contribute to the services we provide. But I think we can do a little bit more to get the balance uh, better. Mr. Raymond McCart. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answers? Can I ask the Minister uh, to provide an update to his plans to tax derelict land? Well, Colonel Mohegan, it is a question, a quote. Uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, at this stage, it is only a proposal, but uh, some of us uh, have been, uh, within, within my department, have been looking at the suggestion of a, of a, of a tax on derelict land. Uh, we want to get it right. Uh, if you look at the wonderful 16-acre Sirocco site in Belfast uh, city centre, it has been empty certainly since perhaps 2005, 6, 7, uh, yet we have managed to uh, get no uh, duty or tax on that land. And I think actually if there had been an obligation on the banks or on the equity fund service that owned it, that would have spurred the rate of development. So therefore, if we could find a way uh, to tax derelict land and derelict properties and an assessment by LPS in conjunction with councils, uh, Con Corlea has revealed that there are 1,700 at last count, 1,700 derelict properties. I believe that could be a way to make an extra contribution to the tax base, but it's going to take a little bit of research first, and I've asked our friends in Oxford Economics to do more research on this issue. Okay. Mr. Ritchie McPhillips. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answer so far. 
Can I ask the Minister whether he plans to impose punitive rates on system on any charity shops? And can he give a commitment not to impose any rates on charity shops the likes of St Vincent de Paul, who provide an excellent service to some of the most deprived in our society? Well, uh, uh, thank, thank you for the question. Like, like the member, I'm a big fan of, of our charities, but we need to make sure that uh, landlords aren't dodging their uh, rates obligation by, uh, to pay 50 per cent rates on an empty shop by putting in a charity. I know the member wouldn't appreciate that either. We need to get the balance right. Uh, charity shops do help bring people into uh, our high streets or into uh, our small towns, in particular uh, when times are tough. Um, so we need to make sure that uh, there is a certain amount of charity shops. But I think the member would agree. When you meet retailers, they say there has to be a balance. We can't have our high streets just uh, just being charity shops. But I would say this as well, and I have engaged with the charity sector. Um, I think that we may look at a way of saying they make some contribution. It could be, it could be minimal, but in England and Scotland and Wales, I believe it's around 20 per cent, but perhaps even less than that. But I think we should have an engagement. We need to make sure we don't inhibit the great work that the charities do. Uh, we, in fact, we want, to, want to encourage that work, and there may be a way to do that in the time ahead. So I have an open mind. I look forward to discussing uh, with, with the member and with the Assembly the best way forward in that regard, uh, but I haven't made my mind up either in that regard. Call Mr Trevor Long. Speaker, just in relation to the Minister's re previous answer about derelict land, uh, would, he, would he agree with me that there's a severe danger that the May's Long case might qualify under that description if something doesn't happen fairly soon? Well, I would, I would love to get some rate-paying businesses or institutions or, or bodies, corporate bodies, on that particular site, and, and I, I travel in hope in that regard. Call Mr Christopher Stalford. Uh, I thank the member for his question. Each rate bill issued by Land and Property Services gives detailed information on how the bill was calculated. The bill is essentially based on the statutory valuation of the property, in other words, the capital value of a domestic property or the net annual value of a non-domestic property. The district rate and regional rate relevant to the calculation are quoted individually. The rates assessment is then shown, which is calculated by multiplying the capital value or net annual value by the sum of the district rate and regional rate. The time period the rates bill relates to is explained with any balance brought forward from previous years shown separately. There is more here for the member, but I think I, I'm getting to understand his point. This is complicated for many of those who receive uh, their, their rates bill, many businesses. Uh, but we do go to some lengths to try and explain the system in the current rates bill, uh, but I would welcome any suggestion how we could even be doing even better in that. Mr Stalford for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Minister appreciate the sense of bewilderment uh, that people face when the bill arrives and there's been a significant increase from the previous year, but they don't see any uh, commensurate increase in the level of services that's provided? When we served together in Belfast City Council, our council sent people a rates bill that showed them how their money was being spent and how the bill was calculated. Uh, does the Minister think that that's something that his department would be prepared to roll out Northern Ireland wide? Well, I thank the member for supplementary. I think, I think there's two points I'd make. Invariably, when, when you and I would meet uh, businesses uh, who, who receive their rates bill, they're not sure what it's for. And there is certainly a lack of information that part of it goes to fund the central government, the hospitals, uh, fixing the roads, uh, uh, encouraging investment, and so on. And part of it goes to the councils for the many services they provide, including leisure centres and picking, picking up uh, the bins for those, who, for those who pay for that. So I, I do think that uh, we could do a better job at explaining the global question around rates, but also I think we could do a better job at showing uh, business rate payers that we appreciate uh, what they're doing. Uh, I, I don't know if bewilderment is too strong, uh, but I do think that if, if the member found it useful for me to meet any of the retail or traders groups in his constituency to discuss how best we could explain what the rates are for, I'd be very happy, and of course how they can appeal or understand it better, I'd be happy to do that. Well, Mr. Justin McNaught. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers to date. Can the Minister ask, answer how many rates bills were reduced following reassessment in the last financial year? Well, um, no, I couldn't tell you that off the top of my head, uh, but uh, if you're referring to uh, the non domestic uh, appeals, uh, we could certainly find that answer for you. Okay, Mr. Cackle Bolling. 
Minister. and just to uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far, but could I ask the Minister when does uh, when is it likely that LPS will introduce electronic billing? Carmen Well, um, when, when uh, the member for Belfast South was talking about the, the detail within uh, rate, build, uh, rate bills when they're received, he was referring, of course, to the paper version. And it is my wish that we get to a situation where, in fact, there is ele electronic billing for those who require that or request that. We're moving in that direction. Uh, we had a meeting last week about trying to speed up the pace of the digital revolution within the land and property services. I believe we will get there. Uh, the, we, it also happens that the current software we're using, the current system, is quite outdated. Uh, and I think we're now, we're now looking at, uh, and I have certainly uh, cleared the funding for a, a new system which would be 21st century, fit for purpose. And as part of that, we should be able to introduce uh, uh, e-billing, e, e, e uh, certainly by 2019 or 2020. Call Mr. Steve Aiken. Uh, could the Minister provide an update on the current level of rates of rares across Northern Ireland? And furthermore, can he detail how much the debt has been written off over recent years? Thank you. So, I'm, I'm happy to get the member the exact figures, but the good news, the good news is that our rates uh, our rate arrears are at the lowest level they have been since the crash. I think that's a testament to the hard work of LPS. Uh, but I, I think the member would also accept that there's a balance in these matters. Um, we want to make sure that everyone pays uh, the money which is due. Uh, we want to make sure that the burden is shared uh, equally and evenly. Uh, but we don't want to be in a situation where we're putting good businesses uh, are closing down good businesses because people have difficulty paying their rates bill. And in that regard, I think we try hard to get the balance right, including organising a system of payments for those who are in arrears. Happy to get the member the exact figures, but I, but I do know from the last briefing that uh, the LPS was pleased to report that arrears were at their, at their lowest level in six or seven years. Call Mr. Philip McGuigan. I can call your Cash Deborah Coeig. Question number five. Um, uh, both the Peace 4 and Interreg 5A programmes, which were approved to the value of €269 million Euro and €283 million, Euro, respectively, have opened for project calls at Cuncorlia. A number of applications under Interreg have progressed through to final decision, and I am pleased to report that 17 applications have been approved to a value of approximately €120 million. Euro, uh, and, I, and I said that, I think, in the last question time here to the House. Uh, they are all interreg projects. The next stage will be for the special EU programmes body as a managing authority for the programme to issue letters of offer to successful applicants. Uh, my officials are currently working along with our counterparts in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform in Dublin to agree the detail of these letters of offer. Uh, I had a positive discussion in that regard with the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform, uh, Pascal Donoghue, uh, TD, on Thursday past. Uh, the a uh, statement by the British Chancellor, Mr Hammond, on the 3rd of October, guaranteeing its share of finances to projects approved uh, prior to, to any Brexit, if it happens, is a welcome development. Uh, the clarification provided will facilitate full commitment of expenditure for both Peace 4 and Interreg programmes and the issue of those letters of offer. Uh, I would like to, to stress to the member that the assessment process for applicants is continuing at pace. Uh, decisions on funding will continue to be taken. Uh, uh, the key steering committee meetings, uh, for example, to consider support for victims and survivors, sustainable transport, are scheduled for the coming weeks. Uh, none of us is under an illusion that there isn't uh, some trepidation, trepidation among bodies who, and institutions who are applying for funding about the future. But my message has been that we want to expedite applications and that we are going to fight to make sure that all the money they're entitled to is paid. And I'm, and I'm confident that's, uh, that's where we are. I'm also very hopeful that those letters of offer will issue uh, in, 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 the, in the short weeks ahead. In that regard, on the 28th of October, I will be bringing together in Antrim many of those groups who have applied for uh, peace and interreg funding to try and give them an update to make sure that they know that we are working very hard uh, to ensure that the letters of offer are issued and honoured. I remind the Minister of the two-minute rule. And yes. I call Mr McGuigan for a supplementary. Uh, Elgott, and can I thank the Minister for that fulsome uh, answer to the question? And just following on from the, the point he made towards the end about the meeting in Antrim, can I ask for a wee bit more information on that and how else he in turn, turn, 
intends Goldman Eskil to engage with recipients of peace and interreg fund? Well, uh, I actually had a very successful engagement, I thought, with the organisation CO3, which represents chief executives in the, uh, in the third sector, uh, the week before last, uh, to hear uh, their views uh, and, and uh, uh, their, their hopes for the future in relation to EU funding. Um, I, I am focusing, as a member maybe aware, on peace and interreg money. There's many other departments access EU funding, including, including the CAP payments, including the social fund, which has been a big help to those who are involved in, in father and higher education, uh, including organisations like the Princess Trust, who, who have also met in this regard. The organisations I am bringing together in Antrim are people and organisations who have applied for peace and interreg monies. I think it would be useful to hear from them uh, their plans uh, and explain to them also what has been going on uh, in my department uh, in our negotiations with with London, Brussels and Dublin, and to assure them, assure them that we will get the result they want in this regard. Well, Mrs. Sandra over here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. Does the Minister agree with me that this relaxation of time pressures now possibly presents an opportunity for applications that were originally submitted in a rushed manner eh, to meet the Chancellor's November deadline to be reviewed and potentially resubmitted to ensure that they are fully able to access um, all available funding? Uh, th thank the member for her question. Um, uh, certainly, if, if the application isn't correct, it, it wouldn't have passed the steering committees. And some applications have gone back, and there is a little bit of uh, space now for people to return. We have asked some people, including councils, to come back with uh, more information, uh, more authoritative uh, analysis uh, of, of, of their needs, uh, and that's going to happen in coming weeks. So we do have a little bit of space. Um, and you know, I have to say to the member that though the process has, not been, has been more rocky than any of us would wish, the criteria are there and applicants will have to make sure they fulfil their criteria and that the applications are, are wholly kosher if, if they can expect to get letters of offer issued against their bids. Well, Mr David Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We know, Mr Speaker, that the Treasury has guaranteed funding for agricultural support till 2020, which isn't much of a guarantee given that the UK couldn't leave the EU before 2019. Uh, the Minister has talked about expediting the process for these other grants. Has he any indication that the Treasury will also expedite the application and, not ensure, that, and ensure that things are not held up in the Treasury and thereby groups in Northern Ireland will lose out? It's always the Alliance Party want to give me more powers. My influence with Mr Hammond isn't just as, as, as great as I would like it to be, but I'm meeting the Chief Secretary to the Treasury uh, next week uh, on Monday, uh, along with my counterparts from Wales and Scotland. And we will be saying that they need to make sure that the EU funding, which has been held up a little bit more than any of us would have liked, that it is expedited. The wider question the member raises is that uh, of, of the receipts uh, in relation to agricultural payments uh, to what uh, he would refer to as the UK, 9% come here. If it was a barn of consequence, it would be 3%. So really hard questions there are among the many hard questions uh, to the British government, to the Treasury. Uh, are they guaranteeing, and they haven't yet, that 9% of uh, the budget for agriculture would come to the north if, if there was a Brexit? Well, Ms. Catherine Seeley. Shale, yes, the whole question number six. Um, I thank the member for her question. I, I am in favour of marriage equality. Uh, this, that is why in this mandate I am determined to make what progress I can to put marriage equality on the statute book. Uh, I would like to proceed by way of an executive bill, and I will, at the earliest opportunity, uh, seek executive agreement to consult uh, on, on the issue. I have also met on three occasions with the Love Equality Consortium and the wider LGBT sector. As the member will know, the consortium has been exploring the possibility of a private member's bill. I have written to the four potential sponsors of the bill to advise them of my intentions and have also offered to meet with them. We have time for a quick question, a supplementary and a quick response. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response and indeed for his support for marriage equality. Can I ask the Minister what alliances he proposes to make for those who do not want to participate in same-sex marriage ceremonies? Um, just, just quickly, I would like to say I endorse the approach of Naomi Long, who is one of the people behind the private members' bills, when, bills on this issue, when she said there will be a need for collaboration in the time ahead. In terms of, of the churches, uh, my intention would be, be to provide the same level of protection to clergy 
and church bodies, as has been included in the legislation on same-sex marriage in other jurisdictions within these islands. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First off, delighted to hear you were at the border last weekend. Minister, I was there myself. I didn't see you, but um, you couldn't miss me. I was the one there waving the EU flag. Can I ask the Minister... Does the Minister feel that the, bid, the budget process he has outlined with little or no scrutiny is consistent with best practice in openness and the 1998 legislation? Um, yeah, yeah, I thank the member for his question. I, I usually, at the back of these matters, he may have been at the front. I noticed there were some other politicians, including my great friend Declan Brannock uh, from County Louth, who was at the front. Um, but I commend him on, on that uh, particular uh, uh, demonstration, if you weren't Carrie Garnon, I'm sure you're referring to, I thought it was great, uh, actually coming together of politicians, which you don't see often enough, not to mention all the other sectors. I'm totally uh, confident uh, and certain that the approach I am taking to the, the budget uh, is absolutely compliant with all legislation. Uh, but I also want to say to the member that it is the best way forward, that uh, there is no way we could have brought forward a three-year resource budget, as was intended, 17 to 20, because of the uncertainty emanating from London. Mr McNulty, for supplementary. Thank you for your answer so far. Will the Minister commit to a condensed budget timescale and agree additional sitting days and committee in December to ensure elected representatives can give fair scrutiny? Well, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's a fair question. What, what the member can be uh, assured of is that whatever is needed to allow the Assembly and the Committee to have adequate and proper input uh, will be done. Um, I'm working on a timescale at the minute that is dependent upon how many shocks and unknowns there are in Mr Hammond's statement of 23rd of November. Um, there is, uh, and I don't want to overemphasise this, but there is really uncertainty about where his intentions are in relation to a series of matters, uh, but he can, he can certainly receive a guarantee from me that whatever time the Assembly needs, or indeed the Committee needs to consider these matters, will be given. I think it will be adequate. Uh, I think it actually might be a little bit more than was received last year in what, what of course, were also extraordinary circumstances. Call Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Social Investment Fund was given a substantial allocation in your June monitoring round. As the key custodian of public finances, are you satisfied that SIF represents good value for public money and upholds the standard of good governance that your executive pledges to uphold? Well, um, I can't hear that often enough as Chief uh, Steward or custodian of, of public finances. Uh, but of course, it's a job for all of us, and, and that's why we're here discussing this to make sure that the, the money we hold for the public is spent uh, as, 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 uh, with, a, with an emphasis on value for money uh, at all times. I have to say to the member that, that I am definitely in a different camp when it comes to the views that I heard, and I was listening to some of the debate earlier on in relation to the social investment fund. I, I'm on record of saying that for me it was too slow, but I do now see the money coming out. Uh, I have stood in Sandy Row with some of those who have uh, made a break with a very difficult past. Uh, I don't believe they were the only people to blame uh, for that difficult past, but I do admire uh, those people who stand up and say that the way forward is through holy, holy democratic and peaceful means. I, I detect uh, in some of this uh, a, a, a bias towards uh, working class areas. Um, so, for me, I'm going to defend SIF, and, and I've, I've heard it a bit earlier on. I'm going to defend the Social Investment Fund, and I'm, but I'm also going to work to make sure the money gets out the door quicker, because I do agree with the member that there have been too many delays and hold ups in, in that regard. I call Mr. McGrath for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'll continue to help the Minister. Could the custodian for the public finances um, agree with me that the Deputy First Minister said that the UDA are still a current paramilitary organisation? And if so, would you be happy to fund organisations that have active UDA members on their boards? I mean, I'm, I'm actually I'm going to return to this. Um, I'm going to invite the member to come down to Sandy Row with me. And we're going to meet people if they hadn't made a break with the past, uh, there would have been many, many more people dead 
uh, in this jurisdiction than there are today. People who resisted uh, the whoosh of, of some, some people uh, to retaliate, if that's a cracked word, when uh, British soldiers were killed in Mazarin, when prison officers were murdered, and when police officers were murdered. And they exercised, and, and Martin McAleese speaks about this, the senator who spent a night on the phone uh, to former loyalist paramilitaries, urging them to follow the path of peace. So I think it's easy to have uh, uh, to mock, to deride, to have this class bias against people from Sandy Row and other areas. But for me, I want to stand with the peacemakers. But I'll also say this: if anyone, anyone, whether they're white collar crime or whether it's crime in a working class area, if anyone misuses one cent or one penny of European funding, of central government funding, or of SIF funding, I will make sure they're brought to book. Uh, just because you've had a, a past which is different from the members doesn't mean that you're not an upstanding member of society. So I want to stand with those who are moving into the future. The member, and I heard this earlier on, you want to push people back into their, into their corners and into their box. There's no more corners, no more boxes in Belfast. It's a shared city, and I hope we'll all grow and share that, that society and study together. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Finance Minister is aware that victims and survivors of historical institutional child abuse have today published their own expert-led proposals for a redress and compensation scheme that would include a common experience payment of £10,000 to all survivors at a cost of estimated £20 million, with a, a saving of £10 million on expected litigation. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, whether this sum of £20 million has been included in the draft 17 to 18 budget that the executive has decided to withhold from assembly committees. Yeah, uh, I thank Mr. Little for his uh, question, and of course, I was there today when he addressed the gathering of victims of uh, uh, institutional abuse, victims of survivors of institutional abuse. Um, the report is only out today. Uh, I have received a copy. Uh, it's much too early for me to respond. The executive office is leading on this matter, as you know. Uh, but I have asked, since lunchtime, since this presentation was made, I have asked my officials to analyse the report, uh, to come back after speaking to the authors of the report, quarter accountants, to come back with their views on it, and I hope to feed that in uh, to the executive, executive office uh, expeditiously. So, a little first supplementary. I thank the uh, finance minister for his response, but should he have, as finance minister and the executive, not have already begun scoping the level and type of compensation that they may need to award uh, and obviously engage with other institutions such as the church, which may also have a responsibility? And will he agree uh, to meet with victims and survivors along with the First and Deputy First Minister to discuss these proposals in detail as a matter of urgency? Well, as, as the member knows, I, 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 even, as, even as Chief Steward of the Finance, I can't speak for the First and Deputy First Minister, but I have met the campaigners uh, for the victims and survivors of institutional abuse on many occasions. Uh, they have my support. Uh, I am happy to meet them again. I have asked officials to start looking at uh, what the possible ramifications of Judge Hart's uh, findings will be, because he has already said there will be redress. Uh, and I will say to the member that, that he will know that the Congregation of Religious Orders or institutions south of the border did contribute €138 million Euro towards a settlement for victims of institutional abuse. And it's my firm view, firm view that the religious institutions who had a custodianship of, of children uh, in, in, these, in these homes right across the divide, that they certainly have an obligation uh, to, to make a contribution towards whatever redress has to be made in the time ahead. I look forward to the recommendations uh, from the, uh, the First and Deputy First Minister. I, I, I think there's no doubt that will be after Justice Hart reports. Uh, but as he knows, uh, I am sympathetic to this case, and I look forward to seeing what the, what the uh, uh, findings of Justice Hart are. Call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, can the Minister outline the agenda for the meeting of finance ministers and officials on Friday, 21st of October? Um, the, the, the good news is we moved it forward to this Friday, so it's the, uh, I think that's the 25th of October. Um, with my, I'll be meeting the Finance Minister of Scotland, Derek Mackey, the Finance Minister of Wales, uh, Mark Drakeford, um, to continue the series of trilateral meetings that we have agreed to do. 
Uh, we have agreed to meet in Newry in Newry Council offices, uh, and, I, and I hope we'll be able to involve some of the local councillors and, and, and the mayor of Newry, the chairperson of, of Newry Moore and Down. Uh, the, the, uh, the whole concept of those trilaterals is to make sure we speak with one voice. When we speak with one voice, we speak for 10 million people. Uh, we will have our meeting on uh, Friday. The visiting finance minister will have a chance to see a little bit of the border region as well as Belfast the night before and meet some representatives of community and business sector. Uh, and then we will, uh, we, we will come together and try and plan the best way to approach a series of issues uh, with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on the Monday in London. Mr Sheehan, for a supplementary. I'm aware that the minister uh, recently met the um, Basque finance minister in August, I think. Uh, could I ask him if he has continued to engage with the Basque government? Well, uh, I always enjoy saying the name of the Basque finance minister, Ricardo Gatsara Echeverria, uh, and I did meet him in August. Uh, and I'm very pleased that, in line with the cooperation we've had with uh, Mr. Professor Ben Goa, uh, that he is very keen uh, to keep a, a level of cooperation with us, and that uh, he will send three officials uh, from his ministry uh, to the trilateral meeting to observe, and also to have some meetings uh, and, and the evening before and through the rest of that day. Uh, it was worth noting that the Basque country, the Basque autonomous region, uh, where the finance minister, minister serves, is an economic powerhouse. Uh, they have a different system from us in that they, they raise all the taxation and then give to Madrid 6%. And I do think there's a spirit of entrepreneurship there, an enterprise from which we can learn. Call Mrs. Sandra Overham. Here in the minister's uh, evidence to the Finance Committee on the 5th of October, I understand uh, that he said of the former uh, Delhi Minister, Jonathan Bell, I'm so busy in the Department of Finance because no one did more damage to our finances than Jonathan Bell through the renewable heat incentive, and I am cleaning up his mess. Uh, can the minister tell us the effect of the scandalous $1.2 billion uh, cost of this mess and how it's going to, what effect it's going to have on the executive fi finances? Um, I thank the member for her question. Never has a session of committee been listened to so avidly on the day, but I'm glad afterwards that it's being recalled as well. Uh, the, minister, uh, the member can be absolutely certain that issues over the renewable heat incentive will be tackled uh, expeditiously by the executive. It falls to the Minister for the Economy in the first instance, uh, and I would be amazed, even with the hyperbole from the opposition and exaggeration, I'd be amazed if the cost of the overrun of the renewable heat incentive is £1.2 billion. Um, uh, and, and, and it's, my, it's my intention to work with the Economy Minister to make sure we sort out this issue as soon as possible. Well, Mrs. Overend for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank the Minister for his assurances that he's going to sort out the mess. But how much does the Minister plan to set aside every year to clear up the DUP Minister's mess? Uh, in relation to the renewable heat incentive, we set aside £20 million uh, and placed it at the centre as a contingency fund in relation to RHI. Um, I, I suspect there will perhaps be a call for another £6 million. I'm, I'm heartened uh, by the fact that there is, as you know, the PAC, and your, your colleague Robin Swan chairs the PAC. The PAC met last week and is investigating this matter as well. I'm heartened by the soundings coming from the Department of Economy, not only is PwC investigating this matter, but I, th matter, but I think everyone understands whether it's uh, 10 million, 100 million, or whatever, it's really fatal that we get to grips with this. Uh, money is tight. Money is tight. We all understand that. And there are many groups, I'm sure, in the members' constituency and right across the, the jurisdiction, people who are uh, putting in serious bids for money who need it. Uh, and I think the member would expect that I would try and staunch any loss from the renewable heat incentive as soon as possible. And working with the economy minister, that is my intention. Members, time is up.